Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Steve Lambert. I am the co-director and co-founder of the Center for Artistic Activism. And um, we have a really exciting group of people here today. Um, and Miriam, did you want to say anything to kick us off? Or you want me to introduce Ibu, I see. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Miriam Kazim, and I organized this series for the Center of Artistic Activism. Um, we're really excited about today's, today's event, and thank you so much for being here. Um, and we'll get started. Um, so, Steve, you can introduce Ibu. Yeah. So, Ibu, Ibrahima Ibu Nyang. How do I say your last name? Nyang. Yeah. Really? Okay. <laughs> well done. Um, uh, is an alumni of the Center for Artistic Activism. He's head of Open Society Institutes West Africa, um, which if you don't know, is a really big deal. Um, when we were with him in Ghana, they have special vehicles with special license plates and they just can get, get, navigate you through all the traffic. Um, he can negotiate with uh, police, policemen that stopped us on the side of the road. Anyway, um, he's also going to be the future president of Senegal, right? Is that true, Ibu? Going to help me get there. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, and uh, had uh, ha was recently a fellow at Yale and brought us there, which was great. Um, but uh, also had the privilege of giving Ibu his first ride on a roller coaster in his whole life. Um, and yeah, it was a special moment for all everyone. So Ibu, I'll let you supplement that introduction with some other things that maybe I missed, and then you can introduce everybody else. No, thank you so, so much, Steve. And good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on, on where you are joining us from. I'm sitting here in West Africa and it's almost 5 p.m. So, but I'm still very energetic, you know, since I'm going to be having, you know, this session with all of you. And I'm, I'm really excited that, you know, um, the C4AA has asked me to moderate this, this session on strategic generosity and, and artistic activism. And I'm, I'm really glad that the C4AA has also used its convening power to bring us all together for what I hope will be a, a very exciting hour and a few more minutes of questioning, sharing, and I see partying at the end, obviously, as always. <laughs> And I, and I really feel that this conversation is, is very timely, given the current crazy state of the world. And we are deeply honored to have three great panelists with us, Aaron Gatch, Alana Cody, and Mansa Goram. Aaron Gatch's that diverse artistic practice consistently addresses public concerns, social politics, and power dynamics inspired by studies with a private investigator, a magician, and a ninja. He established the Center for Tactical Magic in 2000. And this collaborative authoring framework is dedicated to the coalescence of art, magic, and creative tactics for encouraging positive social change. Although the collaborations take many different forms, the work is largely the result of creative partnerships with a wide array of individuals and organizations, including hypnotists, biologists, engineers, activists, nurses, military intelligence officers, journalists, radical ecologists, former bank robbers, security experts, street vendors, community organizers, and many others. Wow. <laughs> Alana Cody is currently a doctoral student in clinical neuropsychology at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, and holds a master's degree from Harvard Divinity School in Religious Studies. She is interested in the neurological underpinnings of moral judgments and social cognition, and particularly the role of moral emotions, shame, guilt, in shaping health outcomes. In collaboration with the advocacy group, Mom Stop the Harm, her research on stigma, shame, and barriers to care among families harmed by the overdose epidemic has been presented to the Canadian provincial and federal government 
leaders to help inform health and drug policy. Her current work investigates the impacts of shame and guilt in caregiving relationships for stroke survivors to enhance social and emotional functioning post-stroke. While Alana pursues positive change in healthcare through scientific research, she's a devoted art enthusiast and believes that both science and art can offer creative solutions to problems on individual and global scales. Last but not the least, Mansa Guram is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Maryland College Park, majoring in neurobiology and physiology and minoring in public policy. She serves as a member of the North American Coordinating Committee for Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, helping coordinate student chapters across the nation to build the access to medicines campaign and encourage the implementation of a more socially responsible licensing policy. She served as a project manager for the Free the Vaccine campaign, a collaboration between UAEM and C4AA. She has worked specifically with activism around the TRIPS waiver, utilizing artistic activism to grow support for the waiver and garner public attention surrounding global vaccine access. As a prim student pursuing a career in the intersection between clinical medicine and public health, she hopes to continue leading efforts for reform within the system and advocating for social and health equity. Wow, impressive, impressive bios. So those are the three fantastic panelists we'll have with us today. And we will start with a presentation by Aaron Gatch. So Aaron, I would like to invite you to talk about the philosophies and activities of the Center for Tactical Magic and how you think creatively and playfully about generosity. The floor is yours, Aaron. Oh, Aaron, you're muted. There we go. Sorry. Let's try this again. All right. Uh, how are we looking there? Can everybody, is that slide showing up okay? Yes. yes. Great. Um, thank you, Ibu, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for um, the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you today about this. Um, <clears throat> I think Ibu pretty much covered uh, my intro in his intro. So uh, we're just going to keep going from here and get into uh, strategic generosity and tactical magic, which um, I currently tend to think about as how to make friends, influence people, and not get rich um, by being generous in your art practice. And I should probably uh, start by saying that not all of um, the Center for Tactical Magic projects um, are generous and maybe not even um, strategically generous, but there are a range of projects from the Center for Tactical Magic, and many of them are participatory, interactive, socially engaged, and almost always free. They are collaborative, and as mentioned, they combine art and activism and many, many, many forms of magic. Um, sometimes, oops, sometimes this looks like uh, a radical magic show with a Faustian spin on privacy rights and power relations. Sometimes it looks like a workshop to make protest signs in the form of kites to be flown at beaches instead of at marches in city streets. Other times it's a, a reclaimed police car haunting a city at night by driving around blasting ghost sounds at high volume. Uh, or perhaps it's a communal joy ride in a hoisted VW bus that's been converted into a sensory deprivation chamber that attempt, attempts to achieve um, altered states, whether those are altered states of consciousness or altered political states is to be determined by the 13 people riding inside the VW bus as it swings around. Um, or in other instances, it might be a collective experiment to telepathically communicate with plants and encourage their growth as a sort of meditation on the nature of communication and communication with nature. With this project, as with uh, many, there's often something that people can take with them beyond the experience of the project. 
Sometimes it's a memento or a thank you or a souvenir. Um, I like to think of these things as, as seeds that get planted and grow long after the initial experience with the project. In the case of this project, um, it's a literal packet of seeds uh, with instructions on how to repeat that same experiment at home. And in the process, uh, the kind of byproduct of that is that you end up um, planting your own garden, whether that's um, in the window of your apartment or in your backyard or in your community. Uh, here we see an installation that's made up of thousands of universal handcuff keys. Um, these are little keys that can open any pair of handcuffs and visitors are invited to take a key with them. And in the process, the links of, uh, are broken as the keys begin to disappear. And as an added bonus, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that lo the local police department is delighted to know that thousands of people are now walking around with the means to liberate themselves from authoritarian shackles. It is um, said that a little key can open a big door. And I think the same tends to be true of generosity. It often provides access in a way that direct confrontation sometimes does not. Um, and maybe by way of example, uh, if I can ask, um, who here likes pie? I can't even see you and I know it's just about everyone or you're lying. And the question that I have for you is, would you say no to someone offering free pie? Um, well, the same is true of the Chinese government. Um, this is an apple pie I baked for them and delivered with some friends to the Chinese embassy in San Francisco in an effort to avert an international crisis. Uh, some here may remember way, way, way back in 2001 when a U.S. spy plane collided with a Chinese fighter jet, uh, killing the Chinese pilot and then crash landing on Chinese soil. And then President um, George W. Bush responded by saying, uh, quote, the American people have nothing to apologize for. We demand our plane and our crew back immediately. And as an American person, I felt implicated in that statement, which is really just another way of saying invited to participate. So uh, we showed up unannounced, presented the pie, and after some astonishment on, on both sides really, um, were invited in for a nearly two hour discussion with the vice consul in which we attempted to reach a solution uh, moving forward. And among the proposals, we suggested returning the crew um, to their families and kind of taking the hostage rhetoric off of the table, but um, encouraged the Chinese government to take as much time as they needed to send the plane back to George Bush in pieces. And we all laughed about it at the time, but two weeks later, the Chinese government did exactly that, um, taking almost nine months to send back the plane piece by piece. Now, I'm not saying that we were responsible. I'm, I'm just saying that the world is filled with wonderful synchronicities. Uh, one question I have about strategic generosity is when we say strategic generosity, does that extend or cover or include uh, soft power, um, which is a, a way to make others want what you want through non-coercive means? Uh, Joseph Nye is generally credited with coining the term, and he has also said um, the best propaganda is not propaganda. And I, uh, I, I kind of have to disagree with that because um, the best propaganda is free ice cream with your choice of propaganda. Uh, the tactical ice cream unit seen here is a little bit like if a police command vehicle and an ice cream truck had an anarchist baby. It's a, a sort of urban supply vehicle equipped to support rallies, um, protests, or um, civil uprisings, but it has also crossed the U.S. coast to coast and traveled from Mexico to Canada, distributing free ice cream and community-based propaganda on a, a really wide range of issues. And despite beginning its tour of duty in the conservative Midwest, um, where a lot of people's uh, ideological positions 
might be averse to something like this. The appeal of a free treat really quickly cuts past people's reactionary defenses. As they approach, uh, they are told that they can pick a flavor of ice cream and a flavor of propaganda, kind of treats for the streets on one side and food for thought on the other. And as with any menu, um, just like with you, when you look at a menu, most people tend to ignore the items that they find distasteful and they focus on something that they like or something that they're interested in trying. So if, uh, if strawberry or anarchism isn't to your liking, you can always pick vanilla and some info on solar power or community gardens um, <clears throat> or your right to protest. Um, when we use that term generosity, it's, it's a very complicated term. It is not always um, generous and when we think about this in, in different contexts, I think uh, we start to see some of those binds around generosity. In ritual magic, we might call it an offering or a sacrifice. In stage magic, it could be an enticement or an incentive. In politics, it's lobbying, bribes, and quid pro quo. Um, for the Center for Tactical Magic, it's often um, prizes, or at least in this case it is. This is, um, it was a project called the Bank Heist Contest, where we use the vast majority of our project budget to offer a thousand dollar prize for the best bank robbery proposal. Um, as judged by a former bank robber, a bank security expert, and a curator. And this prize was maybe less about generosity and more about creating a crowdsourced critique of corporate finance. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> we staged um, uh, this Freedom Fighter Arena where we offered prize money for participants. It was created um, in solidarity with fast food workers, um, organizing for a $15 per hour living wage. And participants uh, had an opportunity to battle it out with corporate fast food mascots for a chance to win $15 cash money in the hand if you could knock them off their pedestal. So a, a chance to whack Ronald McDonald and get paid, right? I mean, who, who doesn't want that opportunity? Uh, of course, not everyone appreciates our style of generosity. One, uh, we made these posters for both the US Department of Justice and the Polish Ministry of Justice uh, on separate occasions. Uh, to help elicit a public response to their ghastly necropolitical policies. So uh, what happens here is these would go up around a city and people could use the phone numbers there to contact the actual office of uh, the Department of Justice or the Ministry of Justice and report any ghoulish governmental activity that they might be witnessing. And although we generously created and printed and posted these on their behalf, uh, in their respective countries, for some reason, they never thanked us. It's a mystery. Uh, art, magic, and politics, sometimes people think these things are very separate, but I think they're all very actively involved in reality shaping, which is sometimes to say that it's, uh, it's a free-for-all, that everything is, is kind of up for grabs. And ultimately, whether um, we're talking about art or magic or politics, uh, there is this attempt to manifest a particular kind of reality and to get others to jump on board. And just as with soft power, this often requires being able to identify and activate common culture, common politics, and common interests. In magic, uh, this includes the understanding and use of hidden forces. And this may, uh, may not be a, as diabolical as it sounds. Unseen forces might include uh, spirituality, religion, or superstition. They might include um, illusions, concealments, deceptions, or it might include more mundane things <clears throat> such as uh, hunger, fatigue, boredom, humor, surprise, and generosity. So hopefully you found a bit of maybe the last two or three here 
and we'll have an opportunity to talk more about it in the discussion. So I will leave it there. And hopefully I didn't go too much over the time. I saw I forgot to start my timer. So um, thank you very much, everyone. And I will stop my share. Thank you so much, Aaron. You know, I got some of the really great tactics you've, you've used there. And I really love the tactic of the ice cream unit. And I'm thinking of actually establishing one in, in, in Senegal. And yes, uh, I would never say no to someone offering a, a free pie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Next, we will um, have Alana, who will talk about her research about shame and, and behavioral change within the context of collective behavioral change. So Alana, the floor is yours. Okay, can everyone see that and hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, as Ibu said, I'm really coming from a psychological perspective. So I do research in clinical psychology and I also provide therapy to clients. So when I was invited to join this conversation and was thinking about what I was gonna talk about, I decided to start with a question. And that question was, what do activism and therapy have in common? And the more I thought about this, the more I saw that activism and therapy both have as their common goal, behavioral change. So therapy is focused on changing behaviors at the individual level to improve a person's uh, physical, emotional, and social health. And activism is really attempting to do this at the societal scale, right? It's changing how we treat each other and the, and the policies that regulate how we treat each other, um, ideally to create a, a happier, healthier world for everyone. So from that framework, I wanted to think about and talk with you about today how we might relate some of the strategies and theories that we use in clinical psychology and social psychology to help inform how we can promote positive behavioral change at the societal level. And I'm gonna do that today by focusing on my primary area of research, which is moral emotions. So moral emotions are, are affective responses to behavior that departs from or violates um, expected social norms or moral standards. So these are things like guilt or disgust or empathy. So moral emotions can be positive or negative, um, but they're essentially an emotional response to whether someone's behavior really fits with our community norms. And they serve a really important function in that way because they essentially regulate our relational behaviors. And that really shapes our society. So moral emotions are pivotal in promoting things like activism, cooperation, and reciprocity in relationships. But they also underpin things like prejudice and blame and punishment. And one moral emotion that comes up a lot, um, and it's the primary emotion that I study, is shame. And shame is distinguished by the fact that it's really a self-judgment. It's a judgment of the self as inherently flawed. There's something innately wrong. Um, so it's a belief that I'm bad. And when individuals are really high in shame, we see a lot of behavioral consequences of this. So shame tends to motivate social withdrawal. Um, people who are high in shame tend to hide or engage in secrecy. It's also associated with irritability and resentment. Um, so it can have some, some negative impacts on social relationships. We make a really important distinction though in research between shame and guilt. So shame is the belief that there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And guilt is the feeling that we get when we feel like we did something wrong. Guilt is about the action. And guilt can be quite adaptive. So it can help motivate social repair. So for example, if I didn't call you on your birthday, I feel bad that I didn't call you on your birthday. So I'm going to call you to wish you happy belated birthday. But sometimes guilt can translate or sort of transition into shame really quickly. 
um, where I feel bad about something that I did and the fact that I did that thing makes me think that I'm a bad person. And that might make me withdraw. So it might mean I don't call you to wish you belated happy birthday because I don't believe that I deserve to be your friend. So guilt can be adaptive and shame um, is kind of a mixed, it's kind of a mixed bag. So why might we feel shame? What are the benefits of shame? What's the purpose of it? Um, and there is evolutionary theory that we evolved to feel shame because it helps to maintain social cohesion and belonging. And it does this by discouraging us from violating the norms of our community, those moral norms. And the question is, is it effective in doing this? Um, for individuals on an individual level, when we're engaging with the kind of general public, it can be that uh, you know, shame essentially results in withdrawal, feeling ashamed because there's something wrong with me, um, so I can't really help in some ways. So, and that bears out in research, people who are high in shame tend to um, have worse health outcomes. So more likely to experience things like addiction and depression and anxiety. And so it brings up the question of why, why might we shame others? And how, how can this be effective? And is it effective all the time? And there's a lot of reasons why we do this. It's, it's actually an important thing that we do. And it um, is because when we see a moral violation, we, we want the other person to recognize it as a violation. And we want the world to recognize it as a violation. And that's important. Um, and one of the moral emotions that comes up a lot in um, when we see moral violations and that often drives our desire to shame is anger. And anger is a really important emotion because it's what I call our justice alarm bell, right? It tells us that we have a moral boundary and that that moral boundary was crossed. So it provides incredibly value, valuable information. Um, and anger is essential in protecting the integrity of the moral fabric of our society. But anger can also um, be quite destructive, right? If it, if it motivates us to, to punish. Um, and so when we shame, sometimes it can be about changing behavior and sometimes it can be about punishing. So we know what that looks like, right? We see that pretty commonly. It kind of looks like this. You're bad and you should feel bad. So while this might discourage behavior that we think is bad behavior, it doesn't necessarily replace it with positive behavior. So, and going back to kind of a therapeutic perspective, if you were to imagine a therapist saying this to the person that they're working with, it might not be that helpful. Um, and so when we're working with your average person in the, in the general public, how do we point out that something isn't working, but we also open the door for the person to, to change and to make things better? So from psychology, we do a lot of research on, on what does transform behavior. And when we're doing therapy, studies have shown that regardless of the therapeutic modality that we're using, regardless of the techniques that we're using, because there's different approaches, um, the most consistent factor that predicts positive change is the therapeutic alliance. And that's the relationship between the clinician and the client. Um, and the word alliance is really important here. It's a collaborative process. And the basis of that alliance um, is an attitude of what we call unconditional positive regard. So that's the idea that the person is inherently worthy of respect and care, which is really fundamentally the opposite of the idea that the person, um, that there's something inherently wrong with them. So it might be that we want people to feel guilty in that adaptive sense so that we're gonna change behavior, but we also have to remember to treat people as if they can always make a positive change. That option is always on the table. And so when we're in the therapy room, we're not only providing the respect that every person essentially needs and wants, but we're also acting as an example of how to relate respectfully. We model healthy interpersonal relationships in the therapy room. And for some people, it's the first model that they've ever had of that. 
We also uh, use strategies to cultivate positive moral emotions. So cultivating compassion and gratitude. And when people um, have these emotions uh, shaping their interpersonal relationships, their relationships are healthier um, and they act more generously. And then lastly, it's really important that when we're working on patterns of behavior that aren't working, we're also providing alternatives, really concrete alternatives, right? People don't need to know just that it's not working. They need to know what's going to work instead. So if we kind of sum up those lessons from therapy, we know that positive relating and, and respectful relating can really trigger engagement and positive change. And that in many cases, shame for individuals, just working with that uh, individual person, whoever that may be, whether that's the person on the street or a person on a Facebook conversation, shame can be an obstacle to positive change. Um, if we keep it at the, at the sort of definition of saying that that person is bad, that the person themselves are the problem, because by definition, that means that they can't be part of the solution. So we always have to, when drawing attention to behavior that isn't working, which is really important to do, we have to also leave the door open that that person is redeemable, that we want them as part of the solution and that we have concrete solutions to work toward. So the main take homes um, that I, that I kind of want to leave with today um, and open for discussion is this idea that therapy and activism both target behavioral change, but we're doing it on different scales, but there are ways that we might be able to exchange ideas between the two. Um, so whether we're focusing on individuals or focusing on society, because ultimately when we're doing activist work, we're interacting with a lot of individuals. And it's an open question of what's effective shaming um, and how might we be able to integrate unconditional positive regard into activism work. Um, shaming can, in some ways, you know, if it's focused on an institution, it can undermine public support for that institution. And that can be a really valuable goal. Um, but it, on the individual level, if we're shaming an individual, we might be closing off the option for them to join the cause. And so offering unconditional positive regard um, can be one of the most transformative things that we can offer another human being. And then lastly, we want to welcome people into concrete positive alternatives, really providing um, a real option, a way out, a way out of the bad behavior that isn't working. Um, and this is where art and creativity are so powerful, right? Art can offer an alternative worldview, alternative ideas, ideas of where else we can go. Um, and it can also elicit on a really public scale the kinds of emotions that motivate pro-social behavior. So those things like compassion and open curiosity about others. So overall, they say that, you know, the biggest change can start with one person. Um, but in therapy, the biggest change really starts with one positive relationship. And if we think about that, it makes sense that a society comprised of healthy relational behavior is a healthy society. Um, and we can all be examples or models of that. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Alana. That was extremely, extremely, you know, uh, interesting. And, you know, uh, for us creative activists, I think, you know, it's, it's very interesting to understand what, what transforms behavior. Because as, as creative activists, our role is, is really to always you know, um, change behavior. So it's very interesting for us to understand these, these different techniques. And also, you know, I think Andrew said in the chat that, you know, when you say everyone is redeemable, it's extremely powerful. And I, and I found that it's also extremely powerful. And it keeps me, you know, thinking, you know, how can we use art to redeem people? How can we use art to provide, you know, options and, you know, alternative uh, solutions? So, so really, thank you very, very much. Like the mention of more the more, violations and the results in in withdrawal so i think you've shared many things that are food for thought and in the conversation later we'll be able to you know come back to some of this so thank you so much
So now we will invite uh, Mansa, Mansa Guram, who's going to present about her, her role in the, in the Free the Vaccine uh, campaign and, and the use of what they called craftivism. So Mansa, can you please tell us a bit more about this concept? Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, there we go. Um, so hi, my name is Mansa. Um, and I think this was mentioned in my bio in my initial introduction, but I'm part of the Free the Vaccine campaign and I'm a student activist along with many other student activists that were part of the campaign. And just a brief description on what Free the Vaccine is. It's a collaboration between the Center for Artistic Activism and UAEM, which stands for Universities Allied for Assumptional Medicines. And this campaign was born out of the need for an equitable and accessible vaccine available globally. So it kind of arose at the start of the pandemic um, and it was built on the foundation of creative activism. So I'm a student activist that got involved with this campaign and I'm gonna go into some of the teachings and strategies that I gained and that a lot of other students gained and things that can be applied universally um, in regards to activism and artistic activism. So just to start with, who are we? We are essentially a collection of volunteers, artists, health workers, students, activists um, from 29 different countries around the world. And here, as you can see, there are hundreds of people that have been part of this campaign from dozens of countries. And uh, while a lot of the campaign members have been young university students, we found that a diversity of ages is really important um, in kind of the artistic activism that this campaign utilizes. Um, we've had, you know, theater masters, scientists, bakers, uh, artists, storytellers. We've even had um, social media influencers and musicians. So as you can see, we really have such a diversity in participants that allows us to have a diversity in skill sets and thoughts and patterns. And that's a really key aspect of the creative activism that I'm gonna talk about today. So how does it work? Again, we have lots of activisms or activists from all over the world. And basically we met online weekly um, towards creating actions for reaching our goal. We had a action mission weekly um, and these were all different, different missions and it allowed us to produce hundreds of actions all towards reaching our ultimate goal. And these were all different types of actions that utilize uh, creative activism. And we also had active advocacy innovation labs and I'll go into that further here. So we had these labs that allowed groups to gather and plan actions and it was basically a creative space for all these diverse participants to build their ideas. And finally, we did a lot of reflection and this involved really thinking about what worked, what didn't, why, and how can we improve on some of the actions that we set out on. And that leads me into craftivism. And basically this is a type of artistic activism that really focuses, that has an audience focus. So it's engaging, creative, innovative, and it can even be emotional. And it really uses some of the powers of art and creativity and focuses these on a specific object and really moving a specific person or set of people through the art. So some of the core strategies delving into these, uh, we use these to train the participants um, and employ these strategies and to kind of get, sorry guys, if there's a lot of background noise, my cat is in my room and is making a lot of noise right now. So I apologize for that. Um, but basically to kind of realize the value of these core strategies, it's important to look at traditional act advocacy and differentiate that from creative activism. So some components of traditional advocacy, it tends to be slower. Uh, and obviously this didn't work for us because the pandemic and getting a globally accessible vaccine was very time sensitive. So we needed something that wasn't too slow. Traditional advocacy also is top down. So it's mainly driven by a couple of people or a pretty small group. And we really wanted advocacy that was driven by the people because this was an issue that was relevant to quite literally everyone in the world you know, at the time and still even now. So traditional advocacy also relies on kind of tired tactics and in-person meetings. And it tends to be based on more staler strategies um, 
And again, this was not really what we were looking for. So the Free the Vaccine project when it was born uh, was built to be very different than traditional advocacy. Um, as I mentioned before, we met weekly um, and there, that means like 10 projects a week implemented and tested. So it was a lot faster to start off. And it was also very people driven because the participants were the ones that were coming up with the ideas that were implementing the ideas, reflecting and changing. And the whole process was essentially guided by the participants. And it was also very experimental because of the emphasis on innovation and creativity and using different skill sets to kind of come up with art that would move people and get people thinking about our problem and get influence the people that need to be influenced in creating change. And lastly, it was very responsive. So again, it was very audience focused and it was changing as like the needs changed as the times changed. So yeah, that was another big part that differed from traditional advocacy. So as a student activist getting involved, um, this was definitely different than anything that I had experienced in the past because most of the advocacy I did in the past was pretty traditional. So some of the core strategies that stood out to me was like being able to connect with popular culture or using a moral frame or using the element of surprise, getting personal and telling a different story. So some of the, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> She's being very rowdy today. <laughs> okay, so some of the stages that we used in kind of going about creative activism was first being an observer. So this is kind of figuring out what the issue is, analyzing it, who we can target and how we can target them. Then becoming a mad scientist in the sense, similar to a scientist being in a lab, creating formulas, ideas, experimenting, figuring out how we can use our skills to creatively tackle the problem and influence who we wanted to influence um, that we determine in the observer stage. Next is being a critic. So this means taking a step back um, and criticizing what we came up with, what we've created, thinking about all the factors, like how it can be implemented, what effect we think it will have, and maybe what are some potential problems. And after we've gone all through, the, through all these stages, uh, we arrive at the worker bee stage. And this is basically going into work mode and bringing the idea to life. So after kind of giving that crash course on how we used creative activism at as Free the Vaccine, I wanna go into some of the uh, actions and ideas that we were able to implement and kind of what came out of these strategies. So firstly, inflatable vaccine. So the objective that we had here was to pressure a university to sign on to the open COVID pledge which is basically something that would increase access to COVID-19 technologies. And what you can see basically from this creative activism tactic, we were able to have clear and effective messaging and reiterating the power of experimentation. And something that's really important and is utilized a lot in creative activism is using physical objects to take up public spaces because that allows us to draw attention. You know, People start asking about the issue and it's definitely a lot easier for a university to ignore an email than it is for them to ignore something like this. And you can see that here too. This was on the Global Day of Action. And this was a large vaccine used in New York, again, for the same purposes of drawing attention. Another example um, is creative activism. So for this particular action, we were pushing the Biden administration to support something called the TRIPS waiver. And that's basically a waiver, a waiver that would va waive um, IP protections and patenting surrounding COVID vaccines so that they could be more accessible globally and in other countries. And it's something that other countries that didn't have as much access uh, were really struggling with and trying to push for. Um, and so we kind of, it's the TRIPS waiver is not something that a lot of people knew about. Um, so we were trying to figure out a way to take that idea and boil it down and make it something that everyone could understand and something that's powerful. And the idea that we came up with is kind of the sharing is caring idea. And that's how we got to Care Bears and holding banners and dancing on the National Mall. And this is a perfect example of how you can break down like a more complicated message that may not be easily understandable and digestible by the public. So taking that and breaking it down, like sharing intellectual property and open licensing and translating that to sharing is caring. 
And beyond that, it also kind of uses nostalgia to draw increased attention. And the day of that DC rally, it was actually a really big win for us because the Biden administration took the completely unprecedented step of supporting the waiver. And the images of our rally were the images that a lot of these news outlets used to share this incredible news, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and you can even see here the Guardian. So I think that kind of goes to show how powerful artistic activism and creative activism can be in reaching the people and moving the people. And I want to share a couple more pictures of this rally because you can really see the emphasis on positivity. You know, there were dancers, fun, joy, color, and we did have an ice cream truck because of course, as Aaron mentioned, <laughs> is free ice cream and who doesn't love free ice cream? That gets everyone. So that was a really powerful example of performative activism. And at least for me, that was also a big moment when I realized, wow, like this stuff really works. So going into some of the products that came out of the advocacy innovation labs um, from Free the Vaccine, this was from a past season, but some people used memes and imagery to kind of move people. So for this specifically, the squad focused, the squad that um, produced these memes focused on the trips waiver and they created funny memes ironically to describe current patenting policy or the behavior of politicians and pointed out more equitable and efficient solutions that could help end the pandemic sooner. So what they did was they created these memes and then they sent them out to MEPs and politicians with an attached letter to ask them to state publicly their support for the TRIPS waiver and an equitable vaccine. And these memes were actually reposted by some NGOs and we got a, some positive feedback from a few MEPs. And again, it's an example of how powerful craftivism can be in boiling down these issues and kind of getting people's attention. And it's also easily shareable, which is also pretty important in advocacy and spreading a message. Again, some more example of using imagery um, that's really simple, draws attention and moves people. So this is an example of um, a different type of kind of performative activism, but uh, I don't know the ages of the participants here in this meeting right now, but when I was a kid growing up, uh, something that we always saw in our history classes was Schoolhouse Rock. Um, so they made a parody off of the I'm Just a Bill um, song and turned it into I'm Just a Vaccine. And probably don't have time to play it now, but I can send the link in the chat later. But again, it's a great way to use nostalgia and something that is pretty commonly known um, and to turn that around and use that as messaging. So I can send the link in the chat for that later for anyone that wants to see it. But this was one of my favorite products that came out of that season because I just like I'm just a bill was a song that we heard all the time. So it was definitely very interesting to see that. Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a vaccine. <laughs> OK, so some other examples, um, one of the big targets, a lot of targets that we had were targeting universities because of their role as institutions that can make change. <clears throat> so one of the labs created a sleep mask in a box that says, will you accept our dream? And a sleep mask was embroidered to say, um, sleeping well, a vaccine is free. So this again is an example of how you can really use like craftivism and, you know, skill sets to create something that's more memorable than just sending an email to a TTO. So this was a really cool thing that one of the labs was able to create. Another thing that was sent to TTO was this gift box uh, that says, that has handmade masks with the Free the Vaccine logo. It has a mug that says, what starts here saves the world. And it also has an imaginary cover of Time Magazine with the UT pharmacy's faces. And that was the university they were targeting. Okay, I, the university of Texas. Is she going? I brought her a tea. <laughs> Well, we had a little set. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then one last example uh, is a soccer soccer jersey. So this lab was targeting the TTO at the University of British Columbia and specifically Brett Sharp. So again, going back to kind of the stages of observing, creating, criticizing, and reflecting, they were targeting Brett Sharp. So they kind of did a lot of research on 
how to get to him, what he cares about, how to generate tactics and ideas to influence him. And they decided to make a free the vaccine based soccer jersey and sent that to him. So again, these are all kind of examples. Um, and there are a lot more examples in exhibit, which I'll talk about later and send the link to later. But some pretty cool stuff and all again, utilizing creative activism and those core strategies we talked yeah. about. But uh, like Jay is so appreciative of my so um, lastly, I wanted to talk about this, the most recent season where we kind of in, uh, employed a slightly different strategy. And we essentially broke off into some groups and used the strategy of quantity over quality to produce hundreds of ideas, slogans, actions, anything in the realm of creative activism. And throughout the season, we narrowed them down and we split into two groups and each chose one path to go to base off the hundreds of ideas and really develop them further. Um, whichever idea they chose. So the first group came up with this kind of imagery to emphasize the urgency of the situation, the virus will use the minutes we lose. So again, showing the importance of something that's easily understandable by the public. And then you can see clearly like tell Biden, we want Moderna to share our knowledge today and stop tomorrow's variants. So using simple effective messaging along with powerful imagery to get people to take action. And this next example is kind of more along uh, performative activism, so, or performance-based activism, not performative activism. But this one was a parody off the 12 Days of COVID Christmas song, um, since the season was kind of over the holiday time. So there was a whole music video made, and again, it's another way to get attention and something that will stay in people's minds. And there is a lot of other examples like this in our Free the Vaccine exhibit and the goal is to really activate these ideas and use the art to reach people and move people and all of this work from free the vaccine has been compiled in a virtual space which is the online exhibit um, and there's also physical ones and the exhibit really serves to introduce audiences to the important issues that are limiting access to medicines and limiting access to the vaccine and other COVID-19 technologies and kind of provide methods and tools that people can use um, to advocate for change from anywhere. And the physical exhibit is displayed at the University of Maine, but there are also several virtual exhibits. And I, again, can provide the link for the Free the Vaccine online exhibit, but that was kind of a brief overview of Free the Vaccine and the strategies we use um, as part of creative activism and kind of some of the products that came out of it. And there's tons of other products, um, again, that you can see in the exhibit. But yeah, I hope that kind of gave everyone a good idea of craftivism and we can talk about it more in the discussion as well, but thank you. Can you stop sharing? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, the online exhibit is, is, is really awesome. And, and thanks really for sharing all those, those different strategies, but also for introducing us to the concept of, of craftivism. And I really like also, you know, the difference that you made between traditional activism and artistic activism, and uh, also like the, the use of physical objects in, in public spaces. As we were speaking, I was thinking, you know, how can we do more of this in, in my side of, of the globe, obviously. And uh, I like the you know, observe, analyze, target, and, and, and act, and, you know, using imagery to, to draw attention. So. So really, thank you so, so much. This has been extremely, extremely helpful. So maybe before we open up for questions in, in the chat, I just you know, want to ask maybe a couple of questions to our, our three panelists. You know, the first question is, you know, I know, you know, given the different endings of, of what generosity is, you know, it can be enticements, incentives, prizes, Words, but I would like you to help us really, you know, unpack a bit more the concept of uh, of strategic generosity and why is it important for a creative activist to use generosity? So maybe we can, you know, give you floor, uh, give the floor to our three panelists just to help us further unpack this concept before we can move on. So should we start? with uh, you, Manta. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if this is for everyone, but you were cutting out a little bit. Um, 
when you're asking the question. So could you repeat the question for me, please? Okay, sorry about that. So my question is, can you please help us unpack, further unpack the concept of uh, strategic generosity? Yeah, um, so I think with a lot of my experience in creative activism, um, the strategic generosity part has really like a lot of things we do is figuring out our targets and really doing a lot of research to figure out kind of how we can influence them. And I think the strategic generosity can play into, the, play into that um, because it can be a lot harder than you think of creating strategy for influencing specific people and kind of what would even like what they would perceive as strategic generosity and what they would perceive as something that can move them. So I think in creative activism, that's kind of where strategic generosity would come in. Thank you. Thanks, Manta. Uh, Alan, do you want to speak to that? Alana, sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so I think I think generosity, um, you know, speaking from from a kind of moral emotional standpoint, fits fits really well into what are our values and how we engage with others, um, and we can be really in, intentional about that. And I think the main thing about generosity is that it's it's really effective, right? There has to be a, a carrot. Um, if, if there's like also also a stick, right? We use both, um, but I think that the carrot ends up being a little bit stronger and more motivating for more people. So offering people these um, acts of generosity, whether those are like in very material forms like ice cream or in, in kind of a spirit of generosity and in, in welcoming um, people in. And I think that people can really feel the difference when they are approached with a spirit of generosity even if you disagree with them. And I think that can be a really transformative thing when you can engage with someone that you disagree with on moral issues, um, but with a spirit of generosity, engage them in conversation and come to understand them a little bit better and have them come to understand you a little bit better and maybe a little bit of movement um, and change can happen that way. Um, so I think generosity and just how we relate to people um, can be incredibly effective. Excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So Aaron, do you want to share something on this concept? Sure. Um, you know, I think when, you know, generosity, I think is, is part of the equation, but ultimately um, we're looking at community building. And when I think about uh, kind of networks of support, of mutual aid, of, um, you know, I kind of came up through, you know, the DIY kind of anarcho-punk, there was this idea that you were working intersectionally and finding um, those spaces in which um, people could come together and kind of band together. And increasingly, we see a lot more polarization and uh, those kind of intersectional spaces become um, much more tenuous, at, at least, um, you know, at least in the United States currently. So when we have these kind of generous spaces or these generous actions or these generous modes of, of activism, I think it offers an alternative to that level of division. And, and it offers um, an opportunity for people to engage and build community, which a lot of people who feel really alienated in society crave even though the internet might drive them a different direction. Um, Thank you. Ibu, I was just gonna jump in for a second because we want to um, make a few announcements before we go into more questions, if that's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna go till 1.30 with questions, but at this marker, we just wanted to um, say thanks to the folks that have made this possible, which is both Open Society Foundations and Andrea Soros Columbell. And of course, viewers like you, people that have made donations to the uh, Center for Artistic Activism really help us uh, be able to do this. And uh, the next thing, Miriam, I don't wanna guess wrong, 
Ooh. Yeah, so um, we're going to put an invite to the uh, this forum that we use. It's a invite only forum, um, and it's a place where we talk about ideas, and it's not uh, on the open internet. So you can kind of share a draft and say, what do people think of this, and get a little bit of help. Um, and so we'll put that invite in the thing in a minute. The other thing we're starting, this is very exciting, is um, our learning lab. So there's our Art of Activism book, and we're going to have some remote training that um, using the lessons from the book, basically you'll do like two chapters a week and work with some of our workshop leaders. And I have to say the workshop leaders that we have are literally the best in the world. Uh, they're amazing people, and uh, it's a real treat. So that'll be on Tuesdays from 12 to 2 between March and April. Um, and what other exciting things do we have for you? We'll have a way to sign up for that. We'll put that in the chat in a minute. Oh, yes. And our, so our DC Accelerator. So Unstoppable Voters is a, a big program that includes both, you know, getting out the vote during elections, but also making sure that our government in the United States actually represents the people that are here. Part of that is making sure that DC is recognized as a state so that the people, 700,000 people that live there, uh, that is bigger than bigger in population than two US states, um, get two senators uh, and get representation in Congress. Um, and there's a long history of stopping this from happening, which is basically anti-democratic. And so we're gonna we're trying to get artists and DC statehood groups. Um, together to work on this, and we invite you to join. The, I think the deadline is tomorrow, so um, keep an eye out for that. And what is the last most exciting thing? Oh, yeah. So thank you. And this is a way to stay in touch. And now we're just going to go into questions and conversation. We call it the after show, right? Uh, behind, behind the scenes, after dark, whatever. Um, and um, I was going to say, as we get into this conversation about the generosity, just to add one other thing is that when you give someone something like a gift, there's like an implied reciprocity. And so maybe it's Machiavellian, you know, but like by saying, hey, uh, I made this thing for you, this is, I'm giving this to you, that they're out of respect that there's, uh, or like just human tradition or something that people will want to reciprocate in some way or feel the need to reciprocate. And it's a way of getting something started. And I think some of those free the vaccine examples are really good. Like we've paid so much attention to who you are and made this special soccer jersey because we know you're a big soccer fan that there you have to respond, like, you know, at least to say thank you. So Ibu, what was going to be your next question? And I will disappear back into the shadows. No, no, no. Actually, I was just going to two questions that we had in the chat uh, that would just take maybe five minutes and then I will I will give you back the floor for the for the final act of this session. Sounds good. Okay. So um, the first question to our okay great. So um, the first question to our panelists so it starts with context. There are over 700,000 citizens living in Washington DC, mainly people of color. They are denied key rights and representations that citizens in the 50 US states have. It makes the country less representative and responsive to all of us. So the question is, what are some ways to bring generosity to the fight for DC statehood? So maybe we can take that question first. I don't know if any of the panelists wants to address the question before we move on. See Aaron's brain working. I'm so sorry. Ibu, can, can you just repeat the, the last the last part of it? I missed part of the question. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Uh, so there is an like a, a context before the question. So the context is that there are over 700,000 citizens living in Washington, DC, mainly people of color. And these people are denied key rights and representations that citizens in the 50 US states have. It makes the country less representative and responsive to all of us. So the question is, what are some ways to bring generosity to the fight for this statehood? I hope that
I, I think it's a really um, complex question that, that you're not going to get an easy one or two sentence answer that's going to immediately solve that problem. But the, the approach that I tend to think of um, in a situation like this is to look at um, kind of where are the power vectors, like where, like where do the decisions actually happen? And then what forms of counterpower um, can you also form in that same instance? So when you're talking about um, tens or hundreds of thousands of people that are looking for systems of self-validation, um, sometimes those individual people are very separated and are trying to channel that energy towards uh, some system of power that's already in place. But an alternative to that um, might look like um, creating uh, some form of gathering, some form of energy where people are coming together and, uh, and, and validating their own power in a way that may um, create complications or even threaten existing power structures. Um, or may just create systems that existing power structures want to be a part of and want to participate. Like uh, Monsa showed that, um, that image of, of the World Trade Organization. And the way World Trade Organization, of course, was a, um, a kind of extra governmental self-validating system where um, trade interests got together and said, how do we bypass national sovereignty? Uh, so the I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't work towards DC statehood, but um, if you had 700,000 people um, regularly taking over parts of the city, not in direct protest, but um, for staging street parties or, um, or barbecues or concerts in a way that was trying to internally validate them <clears throat> rather than validate them through government channels, you have a kind of clogging of arteries and commerce. And at the same time, you create a space in which um, I think it becomes very apparent that in the absence of representation through those systems, people will find other ways to create um, structures of validation. And that's a complication for those existing structures. I don't know that like street parties or barbecues is going to immediately um, come together or resolve that, but I do think that there's a sort of celebratory aspect of people coming together um, that doesn't have to look directly confrontational and can achieve some sense of um, we're here and we're getting together whether you're on board or not, so you better get on board. Yeah, thank you, and I think you have all also provided answers to the to the next question. So for the sake of, of, of time, I think we'll just stop it here and, you know, really thank the panelists for, you know, great contributions. I mean, it's been really uh, a, a learning process for myself, and I hope it's also been, you know, equally, you know, um, important for, for you that you've been able to, to understand the different tactics, understand the concept of strategic generosity and how it can be Applied as you know, artistic act, um, art, art, artistic activists working working in the in the field, and uh, I've I've really noted the, the importance of working intersectionally, bringing people together, you know, engaging people with with a spirit of generosity, building networks of of support and and, and mutual aid, and 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 really you know observe, analyze, you know. Uh, identify key targets and, and act. And I guess here action is uh, the key word and as well as you know, engaging with a, the with a spirit of, of generosity. So thank you very much for this. And without further ado, I would invite Steve to take us to the very last act of this session. And I think it's the more interesting one, Steve, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, Miriam, do you want to come on here too? I was going to ask, um, Alana, do you have any ideas? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot either, but about um, how you could approach these sort of policy things with that, with a generous sort of approach? Um, or like, you know, I mean, I think that, that 
a natural instinct might be to to go negative and say like you know you've taken this from us um, or you've denied this to us you're ignoring us um, and so I mean is it a good idea to think of the, those people in leadership as individuals that you're trying to connect with right I think that's a really really great question um, so first to say that 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 initial instinct is is so important right like that's that's what makes change happen um, when we sort of recognize uh, our rights aren't being respected in you know in this community and so um, that's like the way that we think about emotions is like they're all working for us they're trying to do something mm. for us right so if we kind of view our emotions in that way, then we can marshal them to be the most effective. Um, and when we think about how we're treating leaders or how we're treating institutions, I think we always have to be aware of the possibility for a, a, a defiant reaction, right? Yeah. Um, that we can almost um, be it's like counterproductive to our goal. And so how do we how do we kind of balance holding people responsible, demanding change, um, while also recognizing that human psychology means that sometimes people dig in their heels um, and and out of out of defiance of the pressure, out of defiance of pressure. Yeah. Um, so in that way, I think generosity is, it plays a really important role um, in being able to say, hey, this isn't working. We're going to give you an out. We've even come up with it for you. Yeah. Um, because that that diminishes that that risk of push of pushback because it's like, where do we go? If you give someone an out, it's a little, it's a little more likely um, to happen. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking, and this I think probably all of you could speak to, is that um, there are certain people, to me, to be honest, that are irredeemable. <laughs> um, right. I don't want to name any names, but um, you know, Monsa and Free the Vaccine. Like there was, there is an organization that works with the universities on licensing that is like controlled by the pharmaceutical industry, and we don't really engage them. We probably could. But it would be a lot of work and not for not a lot of result. So there, I guess that's the strategic part, right? Is like we're not going to try to save some of the worst people in the world and bring them back. But there is a huge portion that are redeemable. Um, I know as a therapist, you probably can't dismiss some people as hopeless, but <laughs> yeah, that's a really and it's something that we talk about too, right? Is um are there individuals that I can't work with? And there are, every therapist will have that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's an important thing to recognize that because of some of, some of my moral positions and beliefs um, that as much as possible, our goal is to help who, whoever walks through our door, but I also have to be realistic um, in my own limitations of that. And so there are some people that I won't choose to work with and thank goodness that there are other humans that will work with them. So, you know, it's, it's a team effort in that way as well. Um, yeah. that we all have to kind of recognize um, where those limits are. But I think that you're right. We have to be really strategic in, um, in what we target. And yeah. I, think, I think you're right. There are some people um, that are probably just not going to be worth the effort when we can make a much bigger impact on those who are on the fence or on those who who need just more information um and so we we have to kind of be intentional about that where we direct that energy and effort um aaron i'm reminded of a project i think you did with trevor paglin where you were giving away some usb drives or cd roms or something <laughs> yeah i <clears throat> I almost included that project. Um, I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny who was involved in that project, but um, I will say um, that, was a, that was a project just after um, the Iraq war invasion 
the second Iraq war invasion. Um, and at the time, uh, one of the facilities that was being identified as a facility for making weapons of mass destruction had been built against sanctions by Bechtel Corporation, which is one of the largest uh, construction corporations. They're the ones who also tried to privatize Bolivia's, I think Bolivia's water supply. Um, and then that facility was destroyed and then Bechtel got the no bid contract to rebuild it. So um, one of the strategies for bringing attention to that, but also thinking about um, how to potentially counter such a massive multinational corporation uh, was to create um, an early form of kind of remote controlled land-based, sidewalk-based uh, drone platform that could rove the streets in, in front of um, the corporate headquarters with two sets of information on it. One was a pamphlet kind of outlining the nefarious activities of Bechtel. And on the other side was uh, a printed copy of the CIA sabotage manual, which the CIA created and then has historically leafleted over countries prior to invasion. So they, they created it initially in the 80s uh, in uh, Nicaragua. Uh, and it was designed to encourage people who might be sympathetic to US interests to find creative ways uh, to support them through various forms of sabotage. And inside the CIA sabotage manual, these are little comic uh, packets. There was also a, a CD and the CD provided a link and instructions to uh, workers at Bechtel on how, if they so chose, they could download uh, viruses onto the uh, computers of Bechtel. And this is a part where I should be uh, absolutely clear in saying that at the time, the legal advice that we received uh, or, or the parties that may or may not have been involved in this project received was that the distribution of viruses is highly illegal, uh, but providing um, access to information on the internet is not illegal. So as long as the instructions were clear about what people were accessing, they could then take the next step if they so chose. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, I just bring it up because, you know, you, there, a lot of people might consider that group irredeemable, and yet you still found something to give them. Uh, yeah. And, and I think going back to like what Alana said, you know, like there's a, there's a really interesting distinction between the institution and the people who run the institution. And... Um, the question that came up for me that I'll, I'll throw back to Alana, and I think Steve, I saw maybe you put it in also, uh, is, you know, when we're trying to influence an institution, how do we distinguish between the institution and the people who run it? Because in my experience, a lot of times the people who run it have this bizarre capacity to really compartmentalize their role in the institution and what they think is acceptable behavior and then what they think of as their personal behavior outside of the institution. And it seems like these things can be very divergent. Yeah, absolutely. So that's good old cognitive dissonance doing its magical work. Um, and that's where I think that the institution is this idea um, or concept and then we can change the, the way that people relate to that institution, right? So if we're kind of um, addressing those individuals within the institution, I think oftentimes there's a lot of kind of dispersal of responsibility, right? There's the sense of like, well, I'm just, I just work here. Um, <laughs> and so how do we then um, maybe for sort of emphasize the actions. I think this is the main difference where shaming is about the person and guilt is about the action, right? And mm -hmm. if we really focus on the actions that are being conducted that are harmful and then try and draw out like, is this, con is this consistent for you, right? Um, then that kind of organically 
um, gives the opportunity for the person to almost feel guilty about being associated with that action, right? It's not them. We don't have to um, sort of focus too much on that to avoid kind of bringing up that defensiveness. But if we sort of bring up that link about that action and say, do we feel good about this action? Um, then we can actually uh, start to disentangle the people from the institution. Um, without alienating the people within the institution. I'm reminded of uh, a lot of what UAM does is take the mission statement of the university and then say, this is what you've said you're about, and yeah. yet here you're doing this. And when we were reaching out to these people within the university too, it's like using very empowering language for them. Like you mm -hmm. are the, you are the person like, so that they wouldn't deflect like, well, it's the president. It's like, no, no, you're very influential. This is why we've chosen you, you know, like so that they realize that they actually could do something. Um, Ibu, I wish you had a better connection because I would want to ask how this is working in Senegal and stuff, but um, we're also sort of short on time. Um, Monsa, can you put the link for UAM and, and free the vaccine? Because th there are UAM chapters at universities all over the place. and. Um, ways that you can get involved. And Aaron, I think I put the Center for Tactical Magic link in there before, but we'll send these out. And um, Miriam, is there, what else do we want to cover before we wrap up? Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists. You've left us with so much to think about and consider. And this recording will be available on YouTube. And um, we'll also send a link with all of the information that was mentioned um, and a link to join the salon where we'll post like an actual transcript from the event and whatnot. So I encourage you to join the salon so that you can kind of get all of the goods from today's panel. Um, but thank you again. And um, staying to, we have another event coming up at the end of March. We'll be talking about the power of humor in repressive and difficult situations, which we're really, really excited about. Um, so thank you again. And I don't know if Rebecca had anything you wanted to say or Steve, but that's it. Oh, wow. Okay, here's Rebecca. <laughs> no, I don't. Thank you so okay. much for being here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye.